Today is March 8, 2014. We will take a look at uh, Paul Ricoeur today, and uh, we're going to look specifically at uh, lectures he gave at uh, Texas Christian University in 1976 at uh, Bright Divinity School. And it's uh, emphasized uh, hermeneutics, especially uh, biblical hermeneutics. But the lecture series he gave first had to deal with his fundamental phenomenology and how we arrive at a written text, and then he could get into his hermeneutics. So basically he had to present a, his, his view of a phenomenology uh, in a postmodern sense in order to talk about uh, writing. And that's the discussion we're going to have today. We're going to take a look at... Uh, the first two lectures of that series, and the first two lectures dealt with uh, the post, his postmodern position as uh, taking up Husserl, but uh, with the integration of Wittgenstein, because Ricoeur was very much centered in a linguistic approach to his philosophy, so he has a unique position because he's going to uh, read Wittgenstein through Husserl. He's going to read Wittgenstein through Husserl, and by doing so, he will propose a linguistic postmodern position, and it will be uh, very much in the tone of a Wittgenstein, but it's going to be encased in a uh, structural form very similar, similar to Husserl. So we'll get a uh, Wittgenstein content in a Husserl form when we look at Ricoeur. And because we get a Husserl form, we're going to be able to approach Ricoeur as we would any postmodern thinker, and we can start out with that uh, unconscious side of uh, the uh, Christian or subjective spirit, the psychology of the subjective self. And we'll start with the unconscious, and then we'll proceed from there, and we'll uh, pass through the axis threshold of uh, pure subjectivity. And then out of pure subjectivity, we will enter into the cognitive consciousness, and we'll get into uh, Ricoeur's specific steps of leading up to writing. Now, the good thing about Ricoeur is he does assume that the system is already run. And so, uh, in the same way as Husserl, he does say there is a returning um, fringe influence of our initial work in an external situation. And that fringe of influence uh, is on the periphery, and we do pick it up through a tangential type of attentiveness. And so this fringe influence that is a, an existing reality in our external situation, according to Ricoeur, has six aspects. Uh, when it returns into the self, it returns as an abbreviated sign model. We did the cognitive work of forming a uh, sign model in consciousness. Well, when it returns, we kind of consolidate it. Uh, so it's a, it becomes an abbreviation of uh, the conviction we gained in cogn cognition. It's a iconicity. Uh, it presents a revelation of a deeper sense of meaning. And here's key. It takes an, uh, a form of aesthetics. So for Ricoeur, what we return with, what qualifies the new, uh, the new, new, new venture in uh, perception and cognition it's going to be aesthetics. It's going to be art. Art, the return out of the cognitive, is going to be artistic. It's going to take the shape of a, you know, visual art, poetry, narrative, fiction. The return is going to be aesthetic, and we're going to have an aesthetic image that represents our previous sign model. 
And then finally, it's a metamorphosis. Uh, the inertia of a metamorphosis uh, is present. It makes the uh, estrangement that we normally confront in reality uh, into something that potentially can be productive uh, by being uh, infused or incarnated by this uh, returning aesthetic uh, revelation of our previous sign model. So we get into our, our external world. The very first thing we're going to do is uh, grasp those initial feeling percepts uh, and we're going to find that our feeling percepts will identify with uh, uh, what we hold in memory from previous percepts of objects and uh, eventually you come up with a, a, a generality uh, that stands for um, a certain object that you confront in a situation. But in taking up a, a perspective of a linguistic philosophy, rather than call it a, a, a feeling percept, uh, Ricoeur calls it uh, the proposition unit, uh, in the same way that uh, Wittgenstein talked about the atomic proposition. So we don't officially form feeling percepts we initially form the uh, feeling proposition unit. But uh, a good way to get your head around this, because some people have an idea of uh, a difficulty in thinking through the ideas of linguistic philosophy, but rather than get lock, locked into thinking of a written proposition or propositional statement, we're not into writing right now anyway. That doesn't come until the cognitive work. The best way to understand what this is, is think of the word as proposal. It's a proposal of the truth that you're apprehending in the, the situation that you face. So it's a, a, it's a proposal unit that is a unified generality for certain objects that you confront in a situation. So it's a proposal, not a not a written, it's not written at this stage, it's not a written proposition, but it's called, uh, in linguistic philosophy, it's called a proposition unit from your sensate experience, your sensual experience in the external situation that wants to emerge to a more meaningful and more deeply meaningful event. Now, under this, he's got uh, seven points. Initially, the, uh, the message, the cognitive message, is bracketed away. We don't initially get involved in trying to form a cognitive message right away. So initially that, that aspect is bracketed away. At this stage, too, the self wants to form the sub-combinations of language, those sub-proposals of what is true, at the feeling-percept level. So it is a feeling-percept level, but uh, it's called a, a proposition unit. That means it's a, a proposed unit of the true. Now, three acts of discourse actualize these feeling percepts of the true and present, and it also presents a language code of structure uh, of an overall system. So, there's a, within an external situation, Ricoeur says that we are confronted by individual objects that can be uh, acquired under a generalized feeling percept unit label. And that is our proposed unit, our propositional unit for that singularity. It's atomic. Wittgenstein called them atomic propositions. But within that same external situation, there's a directional sense that is also presented in this situation that is uh, trying to emerge to event. So that directional sense is trying to emerge, and it is presented in the act of discourse. So the uh, for the emerging language event presents propositional content in distinctive units, and it, pre and it presents those distinctive units as a kind of quality and a type of relation, a kind of quality and a type of relation. 
So this first stage, uh, like we've discussed in past uh, individuals, uh, we're dealing with the uh, the indiv individual components, the individual elements that will make up our thought picture because on the unconscious side we form a thought picture. So initially we grasp the individual elements that will be the plurality making up our thought picture. So they are little subunits because they're going to fall under a generality that might have a you know, quite a few examples in our memory that we've held, but eventually they're uh, consolidated into an abbreviated feeling percept, which is called the atomic proposition, the atomic proposal of truth for that unit. Now the, uh, the next stage in the unconscious, as we've discussed before, but we're going to unify the subunits into an overall thought picture that's a, a holism or an, an, a singularity of unity that unifies all of the uh, those finite sets of uh, atomic proposition units. So uh, I've got uh, 11 points that Record gives us here. It is the it is the what is labeled the uh, singular proposition of unconsciousness because it is a singular proposition that uh, abbreviates a plurality of subunits, of subatomic units. So it's kind of a, a compound proposition at this stage. The compound proposition will abbreviate a group of atomic propos propositions. So it's, number one, it's a collective plurality. Number two, it is a set of elements. Number three, intentionality is not formed here. Now that's different for Ricoeur, uh because we heard from some previous thinkers that intentionality is formed at the thought picture level of the unconscious. Ricoeur says no, intentionality is not formed at the unconscious level of the thought picture. Not yet. So intentionality is not formed here. Instead we have a system of finite sets of the phonological the uh, the voice of the truth that we hear and the syntactical structure that is also present. So it's going to be phonological content and syntax structure. It will form a uh, number five. It'll form a language picture. Six. It'll be a unity of finite sets of phonological entities. Seven. It'll be arranged as a synchronicity only. No intentional model here. We just synchronize the elements together roughly in a primitive ordering. So it's a very, very, very uh, kind of a proto first arrangement in a synchronicity, just a synchronous arrangement of these sets. And eight. Uh, it is merely a mechanical synchronicity of sustainment. Nine, there is still need for additional partitioning and encoding to encode it to a deeper level and to move it beyond this simplicity. And ten, synchronicity is influenced by the returning French hermeneutic that we talked about. The French hermeneutic, that little uh, counter blow, doesn't just affect the first step of requiring the atomic propositions. It also affects this moment of the compound proposition that unifies the atomic propositions. So it does have that uh, influence from counterblow of that uh, aesthetic held kind of a body state of what we believe to be uh, the foundational base of our motivation. Now from there we do go to the Dokunta threshold, which is uh, that uh, threshold of engagement with others, where we share convictions, we share feelings, we share, uh, well, this is what I believe, this is what I believe. It's 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 not sharing, you know, cognitive lectures. You know, we don't get into cognitive sharing until the uh, composition threshold and cognition. The Dokunta threshold that uh, Aristotle um, introduced is uh, the threshold of discussing motivations. 
discussing feeling percepts, discussing uh, primarily horizon. Primarily, it's a discussion of trying to define the overarching horizon of our thought picture in a dialogue with other individuals and their thought picture. So we gather together to the, at the Dokunta threshold with our, our own individual thought picture. We offer that. We discuss it with others in a very critical dialogue. We are critical of each other, and we try to refine everything. And he gave us uh, three major points here. Each individual synchronous system of propositions is shared with uh, the intersubjective community in order to achieve deeper encoding through partitioning. We partition the, uh, the phonological elements of content uh, and separate them from the semantic structural elements of ordering. So there's a kind of a partitioning of, uh, of atomic propositions and the uh, linkage between them. Two, a pictured ideal code system is formed, but message is still bracketed here, so we still don't have the cognitive message, the cognitive information of the directional sense, but we do begin to form a little bit of intentionality here at the threshold because we begin to discover horizon. So the cognitive directional message is still bracketed, but we get more of a an aesthetic language thought picture here with a horizon of intention. So now the thought picture has been elevated. It has been elevated to be an enclosed within an overarching horizon of intentionality. But it's still a thought picture. It still is a thought picture of atomic propositions that are feeling percepts, feeling percept units. And But it gets us ready for that big step of moving on to the axis threshold. And uh, that's where we uh, begin the cognitive work and begin to start apprehending the directional sense of the true message and trajectory of the true that's trying to emerge as event. And we get away from uh, simply being immersed in the uh, unconscious thought picture that is more aesthetic and uh, more rooted simply in atomic propositions. So we get to the very first stage of the access threshold and it is the stage where we define the virtual notion of the true. So we are going to form an idea of truth now out of that once we leave the threshold where we've actually had some help by being engaged in critical dialogue, now we're ready to form our version of the virtual truth of the notion of the true for the directional uh, intention in a situation that wants to emerge to event. And uh, Ricoeur gives us uh, six aspects here. The virtual notion will still need to transition to being posited into the actual world. So this is not positing, this is just the formation of what we will eventually posit. It's a singularity of intentionality that evolves to enclose the plurality of feeling percepts that will become signs. The notion constitutes a world as self-sufficient. The non-essential aspects are negated out of the previous aesthetic thought picture. And then we take what is remaining and we elevate those units, those atomic units, to being named as signs. So now we have a sign model that uh, actually has a conceptual sign instead of an atomic feeling percept. Message is unbracketed and opened up here. And we have the uh, naming of atomic propositions with signs and then we enchain the atomic elements into a whole that uh, has negated all non-essential aspects. So you've got the essential self-actualizing signs only that remain. They're grouped together in an interrelated whole 
that falls under that horizon that we discovered at the previous Dokunta threshold. So we have very much a conceptual model, even though we're not really involved at positing into actuality yet, we had to form it. So this is a, if you wanted to kind of coordinate with this with another thinker, this is Hegel's uh, realm of ideation. This is Hegel's realm of ideation where the notion of the true is formed, but not yet posited. The notion of the true is formed, but not yet posited. This is a, it would be a, a molecular proposition to use linguistic philosophy or a compound proposition that uh, abbreviates a plurality of atomic propositions. But now they're no longer feeling percepts. Now they're true signs that point to a future that wants to emerge. And now it is a holistic inclusive singularity of a plurality of signs. And now that takes place in that uh, realm of uh, ideation, but uh, for Ricoeur he simply calls it the realm of the virtual. It's the virtual true. It's not the actual. It still needs to be actualized. It still needs to be posited. It's the realm of the virtual true. So now we're ready to go to the actual axis fulcrum, the actual pivot point of the axis that's going to leave the unconscious and patch, pass into consciousness. And we're going to leave the virtual system and move on to the true uh, actual system of the true. And at this axis threshold, at the pivot point, Ricoeur says this is where true subjectivity of recognizing language as a speech event is born. The message transitions to being copied and preserved along with uh, perceiving uh, the appearance of praxis-based possibilities. So we're getting ready to move into positing, so obviously we start evaluating the situation for places where we can actualize this notion of the true that we've, we have formed. So now we want to find uh, where's the entrance point? Where's that point of emergence? Where do we want to posit this notion of the true and work toward making it actual? Where is the entrance point? Where's the node of entry? So in order to do that, you have to define the possibilities that are available, and they have to be praxis-based in an actual historical situation. So the uh, proposition of the unconsciousness transitions to the event of consciousness. Now we're forming the event of consciousness out of the proposition of unconsciousness. We make the big transition. So the idea of speech as event is born and it marks the subject's axis and transition point. We move on to the actual posited and uh, articulated message of directional sense. And at this point, we actually form the uh, specific particular compound proposition that we will posit. We had the ideal version in the previous step of the virtual. Now we take that ideal version. We've looked at the possibilities that are available. And now we form a compound proposition or a molecular proposition. In other words, what that means? It means it's the all-inclusive singularity enclosing the plural of all of our signs but now it is a specific, it's praxis based, and it's a praxis model, a, po a praxis shaped particular specified model that we're going to put into effect. So this is practical here, not virtual, not theoretical. We've left the realm of ideation, and this is the realm of positing. The axis point is the realm of positing. We're ready to move into the real actual, actual world. So there's a key, key moment there. And it's just a moment of copying. You're not really adding uh, any information there. You're not adding detail. Uh, so you don't, you're not uh, changing what you've done. You're copying it to the cognitive side. And then from there, you're copying it again to the practical instead of just the ideal. So it's a preservation. You don't lose that true that you've worked up. It's a preservation of it but you're transitioning. So the transition is going to take us to 
the world of semantics or the world of discourse. That's the center of Ricoeur's system, discourse. Because remember, the atomic propositions unfolded in the act of discourse. Well, now we're going to enter into that act of discourse in the world. We're going to contribute our act of discourse to the other acts that are already taking place in order to influence the situation and, e and let the situation emerge to event. So now we're getting involved in the actuality of discourse. Earlier we appropriated uh, atomic propositions from the actuality of discourse. So here we get into the real world and we're going to uh, posit our universal, ideal, virtual sign model. We're also going to posit our specific praxis-based sentence. Ricoeur calls it, just to differentiate it, rather than unconscious proposition, the ideal was the unconscious proposition, but we're going to couple it with the sentence of possibility. So he likes to give it even a different name. We will also posit the sentence of possibility along with that universal sign model. And that will create an anticipated propositional content. In other words, a, a, a new compound content, a new plurality of event and that in and so we've got we actually have now our actual positing taking place and Ricoeur uh, as a Christian sees that positing as empowered and it's empowered according to him according to Logos and so something I think he does is valuable he actually has a theory of Logos that uh, of empowerment or force we've heard it before called force and so we need to take a look at that because he gives a uh, three specific aspects of the logos that I think uh, is the best rendition I've ever seen okay under the empowerment of logos there are three aspects number one shift the self's intended meaning appears as a mark in the positive proposition it's the mark of the logos and they is they make their appearance as a shifting in the structure or structure shifter elements in the positing that bear the reference to the notion of the true that is carried by the self or the speaker or the person doing the positing now the second aspect is force the illocutionary force of promise defines the nature of this positing it gives it a very distinctive force, the force of promise. And uh, so that tone encompasses the entire action of the positing. And then third is dialogue, and dialogue is going to take us to the composition threshold. But before we go to the threshold, he wants to say something about dialogue. Dialogue is the questioning and answering that sustains the movement of logos. The dialogue is the event. It equals the intersubjective exchange of the code or notion of the true of the directional meaning and it is the aspect of the self transcendence of the speech act it is it is the transcendence of logos so the composition threshold is the place where the trans transcendence of the logos becomes empowered so the composition threshold is key for Ricoeur that's why he doesn't live exclusively in that de Kunta threshold, like a lot of postmoderns do, he swings over and balances it and says uh, that uh, transcendence intrinsically depends on the composition threshold on the cognitive side of consciousness. So we'll take a look at that and that'll wrap it up. Okay, on the, uh, the actual threshold, he says this is the activity of screening, the plurality of the uh, various posited codes and propositional content are screened and evaluated in a critical exchange between all of the individuals gathered at that threshold. It will address the propositional content, but also the, uh, the illocutionary or the promise that the intentional form also presents. So it's a, it addresses the form or the structure as a promise structure and the propositional content as the signs that uh, point 
to that horizon. Now it is a noetic. The impressions of the propositions from the unconscious reach the concept of idea here and there is a sense of recognition. Each individual wants their their posited uh, inscription and excription to be recognized at the composition threshold. And so we deal with uh, a great deal on the subjective side here. We deal with the uh, self-reference aspect of the logos, the promised character of the event, and the uh, aspect of expected recognition in order to arrive at uh, an agreed upon um, holistic intersubjective definition of the articulation of the truth. So when we get that uh, intersubjectively defined articulation of the actual true, again we're in actuality here, so when we get to that uh, very important stage of composition threshold, as an individual, Ricoeur says, we will, just because of the inertia of what's going on, we will write it out. We will write it as a written litera. And he says this is the semantic autonomy of written litera. And uh, writing possesses two intrinsic aspects. It possesses range where the text actually opens a range of readers that we anticipate that will read the text. And it uh, also carries with it signification where the readers will be the, actually the ones that will apply signification to the writing that you present. And writing will pass through a mediation of being conditioned and textured by the form and categories of whatever genre it takes up. By the form and texture of poetry or the form and texture of narration, the form and texture of uh, fiction. It will, now the key thing, writing opens up a discourse unto world and therefore transcends that very finite environment of situation. In writing we leave the uh, particularity of situation and move out into the universality of world and world significance. We end up with uh, refer referential points that uh, are defined as aspects of being. We address the more existential critique of the aspects of being they become our new referential points for our written narrative. And this is what we take back in the return. When we get to this point, this is what we take back to that to return, where we form that uh, little abbreviated uh, motivational base of conviction that's going to help us when we start the process all over again. So it's that's why Ricoeur Really, what I love about his work is that he does maintain that balance. Even as a postmodern, he doesn't get stuck in the Dokunta threshold. He wants to take us to the other side. He wants to give true empowerment to Logos. And then he wants to take an empowered Logos and take it to a threshold where we get together and really work on hammering out the truth. And then together with this uh, dialogue, we can actually come up with a written excription that is addressed at the world level of universality and that addresses the existential aspects that were uh, concentrated on so much by Heidegger. And so you really get uh, the full picture here with Ricoeur. And then when he completes this, he says, now this continues, it's the cycle it runs. It takes us back to uh, the unconscious side, but it helps us to reshape our motivational base, which is our critique for grasping atomic propositions. So there we go. We're right back to the unconscious and atomic propositions with a new refined motivational base. So that'll give us a, a very good first overview of Ricoeur. And uh, it lets us uh, realize that he does maintain a keep giving a keeping a balance of uh, the uh, feeling percept type atomic propositions 
and the later molecular or compound proposition that's formed in the cognitive work that actually evolves to the point of being written litera. And that was from a 1976 from TCU Press. And that'll wrap us up. That's right about 30 minutes.